Hey, good morning. Welcome to uh, week three of uh, Virtual Olive Branch Baptist Church. I'm Pat Lamon. I'm the pastor, and uh, we're closed uh, as we fight this uh, COVID-19 uh, virus, and we're hoping to be back on Easter Sunday, but until then, uh, we're going to keep uh, uh, bringing you uh, Sunday messages. Uh, once again, we're going to start this morning with a song from Hillary and Erica. So uh, once again, good morning, and welcome to Olive Branch. Hey, thanks, uh, Hillary and Erica. Uh, you've done a great job. Next week, we're going to have a song from uh, Mariah and uh, uh, Mariah Douthat and Lisa Kindler, and we look forward to that. So, um, uh, we're going to start this morning uh, uh, with a kind of a statement that that uh, I'd like to make to everybody, and that is, uh, I don't believe that this man ever lived. Um, 
he, he's on your money. Uh, but I don't believe that George Washington ever existed. Now, I think he is a fictional character uh, that someone made up in order to give us a good story, to give us some perspective on, on our country and our history and, and where we came from. Uh, you know, yeah, I know there are there are all kinds of paintings and statues of Washington. There's a there's a monument to him in Washington D.C. Um, yeah, but but there are no photographs of him. Uh, you know, yes, there have been books written, but but I've read fiction before. Um, it's all made up. It's all just a bunch of stories. It's all just legend. Now, you're going to point me at this point to history books and and pieces of art and, and first-hand accounts of people who actually met this person, um, you're going to show me your money um, that has his picture on it. You may take me to Mount Vernon, Virginia, and, and walk me around this plantation and and uh, show me sets of wooden teeth, and, and you could even take me down and show me a tomb where this person supposedly was buried. And you're going to am amass this mountain of evidence that you believe proves he existed, even though you can't prove that he lived. All signs point to that he did, even though you can't prove it. What you've done is you've taken all of this evidence, you've looked at all of the, the, the photographs and the history, or the art and the history and all of those things, you've taken all of that evidence and based on all that you've seen, you come to the conclusion that this person named George Washington actually existed. So, that may seem a little silly to you that, that I don't think he ever did, um, but we'll get back to that. Um, for the past few weeks, we've been talking about God and our relationship with him and, and through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and um, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we talked about hypocrisy. Uh, you'll remember that, that Jesus was talking and, and he talked about the Pharisees and the leaders and he said, do what, do what they say, but don't do what they do. Um, it, it talked about how sometimes as people, we, we clean the outside of the cup, but we ignore the dirt that's on the inside of the cup. Um, and, and, and we do that too. Um, we, we try to put on a good front for people. We try to make sure the outside looks good but, and we hope in doing that, that people ignore the inside. And then, and then last week we talked about the parable of the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son, you may know it as. Uh, we, how, how this young man asked for something that, that wasn't his to ask for, but how his father granted that request, even though he didn't have to, but he did it out of love. How after leaving the protection of his father, the son squandered all of his money on bad decisions, and when things got bad, he tried to fix them on his own. He, he uh, went out and got a job and, and uh, tried, to, tried to handle it on his, himself. But, but then things got really bad. And when things finally got really bad, when he hit rock bottom, he made the decision that what he really needed to do was he needed to return to his father. And in his mind, he was going to have to go home and face the music. He was going to have to go home and hear all those I told you so's. But instead of getting judgment, the son got mercy. The father was watching for him and waiting for him. And when he finally saw him, the father ran to him and welcomed him home, called for a party and a celebration because his son, who once was dead, is alive again. Who once was lost, was found we talked about how that parable is a lot like us, right? Uh, how we often decide that, that um, we can handle things on our own. Um, and, and when things go badly, well, our first inclination as humans, right, is to try to fix it. I, I can fix this without having to, to bother dad. I can fix this before dad finds out, right? Um, but most of the time that only makes matters worse. And finally, in our mess, we decide that we need to return to the protection of our father our Heavenly Father. And when we do that, we, we like the, the young man in the parable, we kind of brace ourselves for the I told you so's. But that doesn't happen either. It didn't happen in the story and it doesn't happen with us because God sees us returning to him and he runs to us and he restores us to a place of honor in his family. 
he celebrates that we have come home, that we were dead and are alive again, that we were lost, but now have been found. So, for two weeks, we have been talking about, with regard to our relationship with God and our relationship with Jesus, how he sees us, right? That's how God sees us. He sees us as um, people who, he sees the inside of us. He sees the dirty part of the cup, even though we try to, to clean the outside. He sees us as his son, even though we, ha or his daughter, even though we have wandered away. He sees us as a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He sees us as his chosen people. And that's pretty great, right? So this morning, if that's how God sees us, I want to spend a few moments asking and talking about a very simple but important question. Knowing how God sees you, how do you see God? Our scriptures this morning, if you, if you have your Bible, uh, we invite you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. The Bible's in two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament on the back in the back half, it starts with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Matthew is the first of those four. So if you get to the start of the New Testament, you're going you're gonna to find Matthew pretty quickly. Um, and uh, we are in, in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are in chapter 16, and I am going to begin reading in verse 13. So uh, if you got your Bibles, turn there. If not, uh, we'll be reading it right now. Matthew writes, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, uh, I just thank you for this this day. I, I thank you for the opportunity to bring your word. And, and I just ask, Father, that uh, as all of those folks out there uh, all across the country uh, hear your word today, that, that they would open not only their minds to hear it, but they would also open their hearts to feel it, to feel your presence in their lives, to feel your desire for them to be a part of your life. Father, I, I just, again, I thank you for your presence here. And we ask these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. You know, this passage is, is a familiar one to some of you. Um, but as uh, we are now just two weeks from Easter, uh, I think it's really, really important to spend some time looking at it and uh, applying it to our lives and to our relationship with God. Now, although it doesn't specifically say it, I'm guessing that this conversation takes place at night. Jesus and his disciples have, have finished traveling for the day and, and they're settling in to rest for the evening. There's probably some sort of fire that they're all sitting around. When Jesus looks at them and he asks this question, who do people say, the son of man, me, who do people say I am? Now I'm guessing at this point the disciples are reeling off all sorts of answers. Verse 14 says, they, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. When he asks that question, they've got all kinds of possibilities for an answer, right? So let's look at those. Some say John the Baptist. Well, you may remember John the Baptist was the one who baptized Jesus and signaled the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So it would be kind of hard for Jesus to be both people, right? Because people actually saw the two of them together. So the odds are it's not John the Baptist. Then they get to Elijah. And Elijah is an interesting uh, guess. If you read 1 Kings and 2 Kings in the Old Testament, 
the prophet Elijah is front and center in those two books. For, for people of Jewish faith, Elijah is just below Moses in terms of how he is revered among those people of Jewish faith. While Elijah was here on earth, uh, it's recorded that he performed many miracles, including raising people from the dead and bringing fire down from the sky. And, and perhaps he is best known to most people as the, the person who never died. He, he was raised to heaven. In, in 2 Kings chapter 2, we see Elijah and, and Elisha uh, walking along in, in, in verse 8. It says Elijah takes off his coat, rolls it up, strikes the water of the Jordan River, and the river parts, and Elijah and Elisha walk across on dry land. That kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? We hear that a lot. Then in chapter 2, verse 11, it says that a chariot of fire pulled by horses of fire appear, and they separate Elijah from Elisha, and Elijah was raised up to heaven in a whirlwind. So that's a thumbnail sketch of the prophet Elijah. Now, if you if you fast forward to the book of Malachi, and if you got your Bibles open, it's kind of easy to find because Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. I told you the Old Testament, New Testament. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. Elijah is the last book of the Old Testament. So if you're still open to Matthew, flip back just a few pages, you're going to get to Malachi. And in chapter 4 of the book of Malachi, the prophet records God proclaiming this. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So, if you're of Jewish heritage or you're, you were of Jewish faith, not only would you be very familiar with the life of Elijah, but you would also be very familiar with this passage in, in the writings of the prophet Malachi, which says Elijah is going to come back to earth just before the Lord returns. So when they saw Jesus perform miracles, that would lead those people to believe that perhaps this man was the embodiment of the return of Elijah. The disciples then roll through some other possibilities. Jeremiah or one of the other Old Testament prophets, they're throwing out names. And at this point, they're probably pretty pleased with themselves because um, Jesus has finally asked them a question they know they have some answers to, right? Most of the time when you see Jesus asking questions, they just kind of stand there and you get the feeling they're just kind of with their mouth open. I don't understand. But then we get to the meat of all of this painting that picture again, sitting around the fire that night, Jesus listening to all of the answers and the possibilities from the first question he asked. And then I get this image of him leaning in, his face being illuminated by the flames of the fire, his eyes moving from person to person sitting around. But what about you? Who do you say I am? after rolling through all those other answers to the last question, I'm guessing that the disciples weren't exactly throwing out a lot of opinions and options on this one. In Matthew, he goes from one verse to the next to get to Simon Peter's answer. But I'm guessing there was a really, really long, awkward pause before we got to it. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And at that point, Simon, Simon Peter, speaks up and leans forward and he says, You are the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, there's a little word in there I don't want you to miss because it's so important. Notice Jesus doesn't say, Who do other people think I am? And he doesn't say, Who do you think I am? He says, who do people say that I am? And more importantly, who do you guys say I am? See, that sentence takes us right back to the last two messages we've had over the last two weeks. Um, doing one thing and saying and believing another. 
You know, we, we work hard on the outside in order to hide the inside. But Jesus knows their heart. Jesus knows the inside. And with the parable of the lost son, Jesus knew the heart of his child. The father knew that the son would return. And when he did, a celebration started. See, Jesus doesn't want them to think he's the Messiah. He wants them to say to others that they believe that he is the Messiah. See the difference? I started, to t I started today by telling you that we've looked at two weeks about how God feels about us. But the real question today is how do we feel about him? Do we love him but love him privately? Do we feel it but we don't say it? Do we heart our relationship with Jesus in our dirty cup or in our whitewashed tomb, hoping nobody really finds out? And this is a little harsh. But are we embarrassed or ashamed to speak about our faith? Those of you who are around Olive Branch know the answer to this question, but my favorite verse of Scripture, verses of Scripture, is in the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, he says this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your, your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And listen, there's an and in there, and it's really, really important. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that and is so important because sometimes it's much easier to live the last part of the statement to believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead than it is to believe and, and do the first part of that statement. Confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. The hard part is telling people what we believe telling other people that Jesus wasn't John the Baptist. Jesus, Jesus wasn't Elijah returning to earth. Jesus wasn't Jeremiah or one of the other prophets of the Old Testament. He wasn't a magician. He wasn't just some nice guy. He was and he is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Part of the Trinity since the inception of time. My only hope for eternity. My Savior your only hope for eternity, your Savior. Jesus in the 10th chapter of Matthew talks about this. He says, if you confess me before men, I will also confess you before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father in heaven. You want Jesus to speak up on your behalf to our holy God? Then you better speak up for Jesus on his behalf to a, a lost and dying world. Look, it doesn't talk about believing and keeping it quiet. It talks about confessing him in front of other people, actually speaking your faith. So, based on what you know about how God feels about you, isn't it fitting that he sees you tell others how you feel about him? And when it comes to Jesus, there's really only three options. One, Jesus was a fraud. He knew he wasn't the Messiah, but he worked to convince everybody that he was. Two, Jesus was insane. He wasn't the, he, he knew he wasn't the Messiah, but he believed that he was. Or three, Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, the Savior. My only hope in getting to spend eternity in heaven. Your only hope in getting to spend eternity in heaven. And see, there are people who want to discredit all of this as fable and legend. Like I talked about earlier with George Washington. It's just a bunch of stories. It's all made up. 
But even if that's you this morning, you still can't get around those three options. You have to deal with them. Was Jesus a fraud? Was Jesus a lunatic? Or was Jesus the Messiah? I'm guessing if he was a fraud, he wouldn't have gone to the cross and died like he did. At some point he would have went, hey, I'm just kidding around. If he was a lunatic, then all of those other people and all of the people through, through history have fallen victim to a prank. But my choice, based on all the evidence that I see around me, based on all of the things that, has hap that have happened in my life and are happening in my life, based on all of the things that have happened to people in my life around me, friends and family members, my choice is that Jesus of, Na of the city of Nazareth, born in a stable to a teenage girl, was the savior of the world. And not only was he the savior of the world, he was Pat's savior too. A savior sent to earth by his heavenly father to provide us with the only possible way to get to an eternity with his father and you can laugh that off all you want but it still doesn't make it any less true at some point just like me and George Washington you have to take in all the evidence around you you have to consider it and ponder over it and whether you like it or not whether you like it or not you got to come to a decision who do you say God is? Who do you say Jesus is? See, God says you're part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, one of his special people. So we know who God is. We know how God feels about us. We know how Jesus feels about us. I hope you spend some time today and in the coming days focused on that other question based on that how do you feel about God who do you say Jesus is let's pray together Heavenly Father again I just thank you for this day I thank you for the opportunity to uh, to gather here and and it is my uh, my prayer father that uh, that that those folks out there who need to hear this message have heard it and not only will they hear it but they will be they, they will feel an urge to respond to it father maybe there's somebody who, out there who's who's heard this message online who, who needs to to get some things straight they need to wrap up some issues they need to um, get rid of some heavy burdens that they carry Put somebody in their in their path, Father, that can help them with that. If it's me or if it's somebody from our church or, or if it's a neighbor or a family member or someone else, Father, we know that you can place in our path those people who will bring us and help us get to a place of glory with you. Father, again, we are, we are blessed by your presence with us. I ask a blessing not only upon our church family, but the church families across the nation who are meeting uh, through this medium tonight today help heal our nation of this virus and help heal our nation of this sin and we ask these things father in your son's name and for his sake amen before we go this morning i i would be remiss if i didn't address the situation that happened early saturday morning where uh, six people lost their lives a, a young adult and uh, her five brothers and sisters um it's at times like this we we have a tendency to to look at God and go why we have a tendency to to raise our voice to God and say explain this I've been asked by people how how can you make sense of this and my answer is I can't 
all I know is that God is sovereign. We, we are in close and we see a small part of a picture and it is such a tragedy to us. And it is a tragedy to this community and we should pray for our community and we should pray for this family that has suffered this problem and this issue. But thankfully we have a God who is able to step away from that and he's able to see the full spectrum of life, all that's come before us, the moment we are living in now, and all that will come after us. And his word says that all things will work to his glory for those who love him. It's at times like this that we have to rest in that. We have to rest in that promise. My, my prayers and, and my, uh, my sympathy goes out to the, to the Reidner family. Lives cut short too soon. But I rest in the assurance today that, that although they are not here with us, they are in the arms of Jesus where they will spend eternity. As a community, we need to pray for this family and all others who have lost people this week. Again, thank you, and we'll see you next week, and may God bless you. fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I
days Yes, I